Welcome back everyone. We're moving on in our exploitation videos. In the previous, we were able to you know, prove that we were that we had control of this crash. And we got EIP, the instruction pointer, to go to dead beef, our hex value. Now we need to figure out what to do with that. And so we're gonna explore ways in which we can essentially create a stack pivot to take the address that we use in our overflow and tell EIP to execute or to pivot to begin executing code on the stack. But before we do that, we still have lots of things to discuss. So let's continue. Now there's a couple things that happened here that are really important. The primary is that we've demonstrated that our, in this case, our overflow and the overwrite for that return address was correct. So we're really ready to move on to the next stage. Well, what we want to, what we're gonna do in this series is we're gonna try to get code to be executable on the stack. So one thing we can do is we can look at where does ESP point? ESP points to 95F854. And we can look at the time of the crash, especially when it comes to string manipulation or, or string-based vulnerabilities. There is oftentimes, or at least in enough cases that I've looked at, um, pointers to the stack available at the time of the crash. But you can see in all of these registers, Right? We don't have any addresses that point to the stack. Now we might run this program a few times and see that it's gonna vary. And sometimes it crashes, there'll be pointers to the stack, sometimes not. So in this case though, we're just gonna assume that there isn't going to be. And so that'll hinder our analysis. So we're gonna have to make one more modification just in order to make these demonstrations work. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is, okay, if we go looking for, you know, a, let, let's say a register, that points to the stack. I'm going to set up EAX to point to the stack. Well, now we need to find an instruction that is like a call EAX or a jump EAX. Where are we going to find that? Well, we have to look in our binary. So if we go back to IDA, you'll see I already have a, a search box or a search tab. And all I did was go to search. Well, you have to do that from one of the IDA views. So search text. And I just noisily searched for jump, find all occurrences. And that's where that that's where that, those results came from. Now, there are tools out there that'll do this for you, that you can say, okay, I want to find a certain um, opcode bytes, or I wanna find a certain you know, assembly, set of assembly instructions, and then it'll search for you. Um, Ida does it, and it works pretty well, it, well enough for this demonstration, right? But if you were to want to, to search a binary more thoroughly, or you were searching for all, you know, all of the loaded DLLs and the address space of a process, this obviously wouldn't work. So the concept is important though. That is, where can we find something like, okay, here's a jump ESI, that, that could work. You'll see there's a lot of jumps to specific offsets or locations, those don't help us. Um, but of course, lo and behold, there's a jump EAX. And this jump EAX is at an address of 402BF5. Now, what's helpful and what's, what you have to keep in mind with when you search for these instructions, search for these opcode bytes, is that they show up in executable memory. Right, so this jumpy AX is already code that IDA's disassembled, so there's a pretty good chance that it's going to be, as you can see here, it's in the dot text section, it's going to be in an executable region of memory. If we searched the, you know, the memory of a process, and we we could maybe find the bytes for a jump EAX, but if it's you know in a data section or a non-executable section of code, then when we try to tell the CPU to go there, it's going to get an access violation. And, and it won't execute that instruction because it's not executable, All right? So whatever tool you end up using to search for these, you know, we can call them gadgets, search, search for these instructions that help us, you know, build our exploit. Um, you have to keep in mind where it's going to be at in memory. Okay. Now the other thing is the address 402 BF5. So let's modify our program in order to encapsul encapsulate that address. So considering the endianness, there is how we could write 402BF5. One other thing that's really important about this is that we're exploiting a, you know, a string manipulation or a string copy function. And so fortunately for us, the null byte on the end here isn't going to be a, really make a difference. But if, for example, we had a null byte right here, then it would stop copying at that byte and the rest of our address wouldn't be written, wouldn't overflow the stack, and that can break then our, you know, this, this exploit that we're developing as it were. 
So you also need to keep that in mind. Uh, and that if when you go to you know look at these in a debugger, because the, the debugger is really important for understanding what's going on here. If you see missing bytes, you might have to go back and look at how are those bytes getting into memory? And is there maybe something that is maybe working as intended and preventing those bytes from being copied? Okay, um, the other thing now, well, yet another thing to consider is what about this address, right? This address 402B F5 only works if our image is at a, a stable image base, right? And so this is the problem that ASLR was designed to by and large help mitigate. And that is that these, these you know, gadgets that we're finding at these addresses to help with these exploits, they're not, we can't reliably find them. So if, if I gave this program to everybody watching this video simultaneously and you all ran it, well, you probably would all get different addresses when you ran it, when it was running as a process, the virtual address space that it was using. So therefore, if I try to develop an exploit for it, um, it wouldn't work. Or maybe it'd work on one or two because maybe one or two of them would happen to pick the, the default image base or something. I don't, I don't think it actually works that way, but hopefully you, you get the idea. So that's what ASLR was really designed to help with. So let's save this program. We'll go back to the compiler. We'll compile, we'll disable the stack cookies. Oh, I got an error because there's a lock on the file because of the debugger. Okay, so we'll disable stack cookies. And then we're also going to use edit bin in order to edit the binary after compilation to, so that we can tell the operating system that it's not going to opt into ASLR because the, the use or the implementation of ASLR will come not as it was compiled and linked, but during the actual runtime execution. Okay, so that will now disable the dynamic base. So when we load this up in WinDebug, you'll see that this, this image 0040, so this is our actual executable program. And now it's at the default image base. So now this address that we put in will work because we found that by searching the binary using that default image base, right? This ASLR, that address that we just looked at would be something different and therefore that address wouldn't work. So it's really important to understand. Uh, now we can set a breakpoint, uh, 401031. I do believe that was it. Sometimes I'll just do a disassemble at that address to see. And yep, there it is, looks like a ret. So we'll go, we'll hit that address. We'll take a look at what's on top of the stack. There's our address, 402B F5. And now we can step again into or over, it doesn't matter because we're ret. There's the jump EAX. Ah, but what was EAX, right? It was just null bytes. So there's still nothing, if we look at ESP, there's still nothing that's pointing to the stack. Okay, that sets the stage for our next video in which we'll look at ways to make some slight modifications to this program to help facilitate these exploitation techniques. So I hope to see you then.